This month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by six awesome individuals. Illuminati, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Lindsay Trebet, and Michael Fritchie. If you want to become a patron, go to wheredidtheroadgo.com. Thank all of you for your generous support and enjoy the show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? I have with me Mr. Christopher Ernst. Hello there. And Super Saxon Man. (laughs) Hello, hello. I do believe that's what Matt Festa called you one day. (laughs) That's right. He told me to get ready for that. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's good. Okay. If if they ever hit me with any kind of copyright, that's what I'm switching to. (laughs) Well, you are Super Saxon Man. That's true. I am. I am. Yeah. Uh, it's when your personalities combine to become even more powerful. Exactly. You know, I, I try not to let that come through the radio too much, though. It, it's it would melt things, <laughs> blows things up. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So tonight we're going to do listener stories. I only have a handful, but uh, there's some pretty interesting stuff. Um, and if you have a story you want to share for one of these shows, you can email me at stories at where did the road go dot com. And uh, that's the best place to do that, although sometimes I have to pull them off other things uh, because someone will send me a story somewhere else, and then I have to remember to collect it. So email, that's why email's the best. Uh, So this is a really weird variety of stories here. Uh, So I think I'm going to start with Colin. Uh, So Colin, and I didn't put down his last name, and I can't can't remember it. Uh, He was on the show before. He's from Scotland, and um, he was actually on Paratopia with me when Jeremy restarted it. So the roundtable, I don't remember who else was on the roundtable, but Colin was one of the people on the roundtable. And he was a blast, so I had him come on the show, but this was like two years ago. And uh, so he said, uh, he writes this in in a very interesting way, like it kind of jumps back and forth. Um, So I recently had a very strange experience. He says, in case you don't remember me, uh, because you have so many cool people on. I was a guest on your show roughly two years ago talking about spooky stuff in Scotland. So I re- recently looked out my window at 1 a.m. and saw ghosts partying in my garden, as you do. So context, for the last few months, I have been clearing at down the old family home. My mom died suddenly coming up on a year ago, and I have been stuck living there and being 100% in charge of clearing out 50-ish years of old person's junk. It has taken quite a long time, and there was some legal stuff to sort out, so myself and brother can my brother can sell the house, which takes ages, but it's sorted now. My brother is not helping me at all, so I have to do it all on my own, clean the whole house, garden, and pack up the ridiculously large collection of books before moving out. So it's one in the morning. I am on holiday from work and have spent the last two days tidying and packing up stuff, cleaning, binning, and recycling. My sleep cycles are screwed, as usual, and I've been awake for around 30 hours. I'm finally ready to go to bed for a bit. I get up one last time to go to the kitchen to get a glass of water. I look out the kitchen window. In the space between the garden and the pavement, I see three people dancing. There's another person lower down in the front garden also dancing. I'm scared for a moment. I live in a very quiet cul-de-sac where nothing dramatic ever happens. There are never any people partying here. This is anomalous. I keep looking at these dancing people. They seem to be drifting in and out of one another. Am I looking at ghosts? I look in, I run into the bedroom and I look out of the window there. Oh, no. The dancing ghosts are still there. I decide to go to bed because I don't like ghosts. They're not there in the morning. Now, more context. So here comes the pareidolia. So I was sleep deprived for the first time in 30 plus years since it was built and paired with a human family. This house was being torn apart and rearranged. The weather was very hot, and I was gardening for quite a long time, a state of affairs generally unusual in Scotland. Um, I also got called to jury duty, which in the end I didn't have to go to, but that was pretty stressful. I was running on stress and adrenaline for a few days. Uh, Hey, no booze or drugs either, just to clarify. Also, in a few days, I was going to get new glasses as my eyesight was getting a bit blurry. 
I did not have my glasses on when I saw the dancing people. People walk dogs outside my place, and I see them out the window just fine. Final context. A few seconds in, I was sure I was hallucinating, but at the same time, paradoxically, I felt as if something was waiting for me. Hello, old friends. Liminality, anti-structure, and hauntology. I feel like Jeff Ritzman was whispering in my ear and saying, there it is. That is awesome. That's great. I feel like I should, I should have just had him read it because, (laughs) but yeah, that's, uh, that's some interesting stuff. Very famous. First thing that I sort of think about is, you know, he said that his mom passed suddenly and I, you know, I don't know what his relationship was like with his mom or, you know, what his, uh, you know, the other people that might've been in her, his, his mom's life. But, um, uh, if they're ghosts and he says they're, they say they're ghosts, which, you know, I believe if you say that, then, um, uh, if you know, it couldn't have something to do with the people that had just passed that were there perhaps. Right. Yeah. But he's right. I mean, it's a, it's a total, you know, I mean, the, ha- the house is being moved. He's under all kinds of liminal stuff going yes. on. I mean, it's, it's right. sleep deprived. It's the perfect marriage for weird stuff Completely. to happen. But the dancing, the dancing, bit. the dancing yeah. makes me think Faye. Yeah. I want to know what the dance looked like. <laughs> I was thinking that too. Yeah. yeah and what I, the I, movements were like. Yeah, I got the Fay vibe, and then um, have you ever seen footage of the haunted mansion, the the ride? No, yeah, I've been on it. <laughs> okay, so you've been, you know, there's yeah, a yeah, there's I have a part of the ride, uh, and and I think if you Google or get on YouTube, you can probably find it. So everybody will know what we're talking about. But there's a part of the ride where uh, the thing you're seated in goes sort of over a banquet that's happening and mm, yep. there are all these ghostly figures dancing and of course it's set in i mean it's a very victorian looking scene but the effect that's done has it where they look like they're passing through the furniture as they're dancing and things yeah. like that and they're dancing sort of in like circular kind of like waltzy yeah correctly right because you're like looking over the balconies you go by yeah if if i remember yeah you got it that's it that's it and uh, it's an interesting effect and it's an old stage effect where yeah there's a a a piece of glass that you can't see but Mm. you can see the figures reflected in it so it looks a half silver glass is what it is yeah that's yeah. it. That's it. We uh, try to use it in like trick cinematography too. Sometimes it's cool the uh, effects you can get. Yeah, yeah. And so the whole time you're reading the story, I was imagining like I was really trying hard not to see that. Uh, oh, that's totally hard. what I was seeing too. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. his that's last, why I was wondering what it looked like. His last name is Karis. Colin Karis. He was on August twenty first, twenty twenty one. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah he was. Well, he there's was... something that seems like I, I mean, you're talking about Jeff Ritzman, and I feel like uh, you know the way that Jeff looked at uh, the phenomena and the paranormal. Uh, it, it makes me the dancing struck me as something that's there's something archetypal about it, and I don't mm-hmm. know if like you know, the place or the emotions that are behind it again, you know, searching for a source behind why these things exist or happen. <clears throat> that might be, uh, you know, uh, an impossible task, but what the effect and the impact of it is and sort of what it's picking up on and, uh, like, re, uh, re uh, interpreting and putting back into our faces in this instance, it seems to me that there's something very sort of like, I would use the term classical about it, you know, like, mm, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, or, or traditional or, um, uh, you know, uh, historical, I, you know, those are all probably yeah. bad ways to describe it. No, I know what but, you mean though. Um, yeah. And I think that, the, that I find that to be like, uh, kind of, uh, comforting that you can still have experiences like that. Cause I don't know, maybe that's, you know, If you think about the way the experiences have sort of changed for like the subtleties of them have changed over the course of the centuries, you know, the fact that the variety of experience can still include something that's sort of romantic like that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it made Colin feel uncomfortable or weird, in which case, you know, but I I, I have more of a positive outlook towards these things or or romantic outlook, I guess. I I, I, I like how he says, I don't like ghosts, so I just went to bed. yeah right yeah, that's, that's yeah you you go that's it <laughs> i did like that he was comfortable enough to just choose to go to bed even if right yeah, right yeah. so that that adds an interesting dimension to it because it's almost uh 
I can't be bothered more than a, a yeah. Like, you know, this is just too much right now. It's interesting. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> oh, look, ghosts. Oh, yeah. Bedtime. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, our next story uh, comes from a Patreon, actually. And I hope I'm saying their name right. Anson. Uh, it says, uh, let me jump up here a little bit. Uh, this happened circular, uh, circa 1996 or 1997 on a winter morning. I come from northern Germany from a small fishing village on the North Sea's coast. I was about 14 or 15 years old, and on that winter morning, I walked in the dark to the school bus. The bus was already in sight, and it was about 20 to 7. Then it happened. It suddenly became bright as day but not only in one place in the sky, but everywhere. I turned around and tried to see where it was coming from, but I couldn't make out anything. It became so bright that everything turned into a glistening light, and I couldn't see anything but light. I held out my hand in front of my eyes when it got so bright, but I couldn't see anything anymore. I thought at the time that it was, I thought at that time, that was it now. Somebody dropped an atomic bomb. This state lasted for about 30 seconds and then slowly became dark again. When I arrived at the bus stop, it was dead silent. Not a single child said anything or frolicked. Not a single kid said anything during the entire bus ride either. I was also quiet, thinking about what happened. I really wanted to talk to someone about it, but I didn't dare talk to my friends. That's how it is at that age. Puberty and the worry to make oneself uh, oneself ridiculous. This incident kept me intensely busy, and, and I feverishly wished that it would happen again. My wish was granted two years later. It was a winter again. The light was glaring and all the children were paralyzed afterwards. I don't know whether I had already bothered my mother with it the first time, but at the last, last but at the latest, the second time. Uh, so she doesn't know if she said anything the first time, but she definitely did the second time. She said she hadn't noticed anything. Everything was as usual. This white light swallowed everything. How could you not have noticed it? It was just as if there was nothing left. No houses, not you. Everything was white light. My mother said that that could have been a weather balloon, oddly enough. Uh, this explanation did not satisfy me. There are no military bases near there either. I have no idea what, what it could have been. <laughs> I have seen some celestial phenomena before, but by far this was the most impressive. Uh, let me add to my story that I think something like this should have been in the newspaper or should have been reported on local television or radio. I read the newspaper and watched TV the days after, and there was nothing about it. With such an impressive event, somebody should have reported it. It was far too big to be ignored. Wow. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. it wasn't just big. It sounded like it, it took, like everything became light. Yeah. 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 Uh, wow. You know, so I would be curious if, you know, this person's experienced any kind of missing time or anything like that. Um, you know, you get that, you know, it bright as daylight outside at night kind of thing quite a bit with, uh, abduction accounts and things like that. So true. true. Yeah. Not, not to say that's what happened, but it, it would be probably something that I would go back and, and think about if it were me, just because it, that, that sticks out so much. And then also the fact that it wasn't yeah. witnessed outside of them. Well, and she doesn't say anyone else necessarily experienced it, but their responses, yeah, their behavior afterwards suggests that they did, but it's possible she might be the only one who remembered it. Maybe it was something that everyone else right. just blocked out. You know, uh, they, they were kind of like subconsciously aware something weird happened, but they immediately forgot it, mm -hmm. which is very common when it yes. comes to, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, you know, evidence, anecdotal and otherwise, I would say of people, you know, uh, who have that, you know, one person experiences or sees one thing and then another person sees something. And yeah, one, you, one person sees a UFO, another person sees a bird, right? right. Or they forget mm -hmm. and only one person remembers completely. I mean, it, it sounds different than something like, I don't know, I'm thinking of like, what was that called? The, uh, the dark day of, of 1780. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Cause everyone saw know, that. Everyone yeah. saw that, right? Um, or some of those things like uh, was the uh, the Dresden lights, or you know things like where it was public. This sounds more like a sort of a personal experience. Or if the other people were around, it was one of those things that you know maybe it was an experience that was meant for this uh, uh, individual person, but sort of there was like a bleed over that other people sensed it. I mean, yeah. that kind yeah. of light to me sounds a lot more like at least in the accounts that you know from from reading and you know research 
a lot more like a, uh, the light of a religious experience. Um, uh, yes. It makes me think of the Sufi uh, notion of Nur, uh, which is uh, mm -hmm. N-U-R or N-O-O-R. And it's the the cold light of the night is, is what it or the heatless light. And it's essentially like this this mystical light that is the uh uh the within sufi cosmology is sort of the basis for everything it's like the underlying matrix uh you know that is uh below everything um and that a lot of people experience when they're experiencing having spiritual experiences and seeing this sort of like intense light of you know god i guess in the sense of sufi uh faith it's it's this new the the newer light they talk about mm. and 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 it takes me back to that uh that latest john dies at the end book where he says uh uh what is it here um you might see it but you won't remember seeing it while even while you're actively looking at it mm. yeah 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 right absolutely yep so yeah and how we perceive reality i mean we've talked about that plenty you know how yeah. how I, All of us might process things differently. So if you have something that anomalous, yeah. like the whole place lighting up, I mean, who knows what, what, how people are going to interpret that. Again, right. I'd really be curious sort of what happened to, was this person's name was Anson or something yeah. like that, yep. I think. Yeah. After, you know, what, what happened to you after this, or if there were, you know, even if it took, you know, a couple months or years, or, but if there was some sort of change or shift that you noticed or uh, something that, you know, um, yeah, a, a, a change in your life uh, or even in the way that you think about things. Um, I'd be curious because, uh, again, when with all of these ex with all of these phenomena and experiences, um, I really think that the the effect rather than the cause is the thing that we can kind of pinpoint. The cause is so hard. Uh, but, you know, looking at the effects of why can maybe lead us back to figuring out what the cause is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how many mm -hmm. times do things like that happen to people and they just don't notice? Right. For sure. You know, notice they yeah. write it off. They just, yeah. you know, give it a mundane explanation in their mind and don't think of it again yep you know which maybe then you could pose the question that the dynamic is that these things are happening all the time everywhere constantly and it's just that most people don't notice them yeah so it's actually yeah. common and not uncommon or supernatural at all uh yeah <laughs> yeah well yeah, that's that uh, uh uh rare normal that we've talked about once yeah or twice yeah yeah yeah. yeah, rare, yeah. rare event, rare. Yeah, they're they're normal events. They're just very rare. Yeah, yeah. Because it it occurred to me what we're talking about too when we we're saying that it could you know if you were going to write it off you might just assume like oh that was a transformer or something that uh, uh, shorted out you know those always have a nice glow to them or something and just like that's what it was whatever you know and yeah decide that it's easier to accept that than think about it right and go right. about your day or yeah. night or well, it was a weather it was a weather balloon mm. as her mom said yeah it was a weather balloon yeah, weather yeah balloon. exactly all like weather balloon okay. that, that took on the light of the sun and filled <laughs> the entirety of my vision <laughs> yes yes it was a weather balloon <laughs> uh okay so uh this one um i don't know if they want to be using their name or not um I'll just I'll I'll just start telling the story cuz I'm not sure if they want their name on the air or not. Um so they said I had to be a somewhere at 9 a.m. yesterday for business and when I was finished I wanted to catch a bus back home. I arrived at the bus stop. I needed to use the men's room. There was a hotel nearby that I knew very well. I'd been there a couple times for a Freemasons meeting. I entered the building and I asked the directions for the nearest bathroom. I walk all the way through a long very long corridor to the bathroom. When finished, just turning my way back to the reception, and suddenly a voice in my head said, turn back and walk walk the opposite direction. The voice was not mine. It sounded calm, but with a very urgent appeal. And again, this was not my voice, and it talked in English to me. I'm na My native language is Dutch. I could hear oh. myself say, you know, WTF, surprised to hear a voice when nobody else was even near me. And I turned around and kept walking the wrong direction. Before I realized why I just obeyed a voice in my head, I saw a woman on the ground near the door portal having convulsions. Her mouth was foaming and there was blood on her face. I knew immediately she had a tonic seizure. I had been a teacher for people with disabilities 20 years ago, and I had seen this happen a couple of times. 
I immediately laid her on her back and called, called Siri on my phone to call for an ambulance. At that time, a lady from the hotel staff passed by and ran in my direction and helped. The ambulance took 11 minutes to get to the hotel, and by that time, the poor lady was coming by from her epileptic seizure. They brought her to the hospital to check for further injuries. The hotel was so nice to pay for my taxi back to my place. When I was uh, home, when I got home, I was quite shocked to realize I was hearing a voice in my head, more shocked that I obeyed the voice without any logical explanation. The lady with the epileptic seizure uh, probably would have been laying there a while longer had I not heard this voice. The hotel was quite empty and quiet. I don't believe in guardian angels, but maybe I should reconsider that thought. And I wonder if it has a relation with the UFO experience in 1989 and my displacement experience in 1996. We've talked about both of those on the show. I just don't remember what they are off the top of my head. Uh, okay. uh, and after okay. those two experiences, that I had an idea that I was finished with the paranormal, but it never seems to stop. <laughs> oh, you know, I it, find. Go, yeah, go, go, no, go ahead, Saxon, because I think okay. you're. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, you know, yeah. if you're open to these things, uh, you know, they find you. They do, and so the connection between uh, the listeners' other stories may simply be that they're a good uh, uh, receiver for these things, and so uh, you know that person was having the seizure, and lo and behold, there was somebody nearby that would understand what needed to be done and was open to that type of communication. So something advocated on that person's behalf that was having the seizure. Yeah, uh, I mean that's that's where my brain goes on that anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing that I think is, and I heard you sort of remark with a a, a gasp in that it was English. And I think yes. I find that really interesting because it makes it brings up a lot of questions for me. Uh, in that, is it something that you know? I, I'd be curious if the woman who was having the seizure, if English was her first language. So, is mm -hmm. this something that's like you know that she's creating, you know, um, and saying like uh, unconsciously to him? Uh, as sort of a, some sort of protection mechanism, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or is it that you have some sort of benevolent psychic like, uh, you know, Whitley Strieber's uh, Master of the Key, you know, or um, uh, Ingo Swan's, you know, psychic aliens that are around i guess those were evil uh but in any case that sort of idea of there being you know people who have powers but are still you know human enough that they wouldn't necessarily know how to help this person medically so they put a they knew that that per their reading minds or something and saying like all right this person does um i've heard anecdotes of things like this before um and oh yeah particularly yeah. though in like uh uh you know for me, at least, these were all uh, through people that thought they were sort of religious and having like saints talk to them. But then there are other people that I think that have had it that uh, believe it's something completely different. So um, it's kind of that third man syndrome, too. Yeah. Mm. Or mm -hmm. is it syndrome. What is it? Third man. Right. I know what you're talking about. Where, where, someone, where someone will suddenly be there with them and help them out. Um, yeah. yeah. Or and even as soon as like other people get there, that person is gone. Yeah. 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 Or they'll feel a hand like, you know, they're drowning and they'll feel a hand reach down and pull them to the surface, but there's no one there. Um, yeah. You know, it seems like these things happen. And when I had Suzanne Chancellor on, she was talking about the experience she had where she uh, was apparently found herself saving someone from a, uh, a someone's baby in a bus. Yep. And oh, yep. so she, you know, and she looked it up and there was a bus crash the day, you know, around the same time that she was having that experience. Um, yeah. so, I mean, maybe that's what he got. Someone was there, but they yeah. couldn't interact physically and they were just like, Hey, yeah. walk the other direction. Yeah. yeah. Um, wow. I had something, it wasn't a voice. <clears throat> I, uh, so I was, uh, I can't remember if I was, I think I was going to a concert, but, uh, I needed to stop at Walmart. You going to a concert? <laughs> I don't go to that many, really. <laughs> Maybe about one a month at this point. Have you ever been to a concert before? I, I bring the concerts to me, okay? That's true. Oh. Okay. All right. All right. That um, was the best flex you could have possibly said, by the way. That was the what? The it's best true, flex though. possible just then. <laughs> I bring the concerts to me. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I have uh, the, the car I have is a 2011 Cruise. It does not have Bluetooth in it. They started Bluetooth in 2012. So I have a 
FM adapter in the car that I can just that that broadcasts on like whatever frequency on the radio yes. and it picks up from the phone and mm-hmm. they're, they're cheap. They're like 15 bucks or something like that. Yep. So I had it for a while and I go get in to go to this concert and it won't come on. And I'm like, great, it's dead. Wonderful. So I go back into the house and I get my Bluetooth speaker that I have to use in the other car because the other car survived the flood. Uh, and mm. it, to say it has electrical issues is a vast understatement, but that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> so uh, this one's starting to get electrical issues too, but I think that's because of me, not a flood. Anyway, I get the Bluetooth speaker, I toss it up on the dashboard, and I start driving. And I was going to stop in uh, Canandaigua and, and Walmart because it's a nicer Walmart because I needed something. I don't know what I, what I needed. But um, now I needed to get that adapter, you know, and I'm like, I might as well just get another one while I'm there. So I'm driving up there and I realize that where the speaker is, is actually blocking my dash cam. And I'm like, well, I can't have that because that's when something's going to happen. Of course. Yeah. So I had to go through Geneva to get to Canada when I said, I'll just stop at the Geneva one. I'm right here. I won't take the extra 20 minutes to get to Canandaigua. I'll just go in and get the adapter. So I go in, I get the adapter, I get whatever else I needed. And I get up to the register. And as I'm getting up to the register, uh, this woman's walking away. And I look down and there is a stack of cash sitting on the the output. Whoa. And wow. I look over at her and I just te- and I tear it up after her. And I'm going, I don't want to startle her because here I am, this big guy dressed all in black, probably with like a satanic mask on or something. And I, and I kind of like kind of run around her and I'm like, hey, hey, and she's like, and she looks like, yeah. And I'm like, you left your money in the register. I had moved the cart in front of it so no one else would see it. And mm-hmm. she just gets this look of shock on her face. And she's like, oh, my God. And like she walks back and she's like thanking me. And then she calls me an angel. And I'm like, well, okay, oh, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like it was a decent amount of money. And she was just, yeah. you know, and I'm like, I kind of hope other people would have done that. But I realize that's not always going to be the case. Yeah. And so I get back in the car and I put the new adapter in. I go to the concert. I get home later. And I'm like, was this also I'd stop at the Geneva Walmart? I take the old adapter, I put it in, it freaking works. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. So yeah, I would not have stopped at that Walmart right. if the adapter right. was working. She would may you know? have maybe she really needed that money. And the universe yeah. said, Well, how can we do this? All right, we'll just put you here and you here, and there you go. Mm-hmm. Well, that's mm-hmm. it's very similar to honestly like the same uh, uh same sort of Sufi cosmology that this idea that there is, I mean, it's, they talk about it in terms of, um, the Abdals and these saints, there's this hierarchy of like this different sort of hierarchical tiers of saints and agents, uh, that work for, you know, essentially the universe. They work for the Q tub, which is the personification, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the sort of the, that means the pivot, the pole, this is the axis around which the universe spins. Mm. Again, these are all these very sort of philosophical ways of talking about what's essentially a control system. Um, uh, and, but within that control system, um, there are, you know, and I've heard multiple accounts to these ideas of shape shifting beings, beings that have no, um, physical form, but are just spirit. Uh, beings of light, um, uh, beings, yeah, that can, uh, like I said, shape shift from one form to another. Being uh, beings that can, like, I'm sorry, uh, like BAMP transport, you know, nightcrawler style from one place to another and stuff like that. So I find it very interesting sometimes when you have this intersection of what seems like some sort of natural control system, um, you know, like the universe doing something to uh, create some sort of change through uh, impacting or affecting human interaction. So, yeah. you know, Soraya's thing not working or somebody getting, uh, you know, a, a voice talking in their head. Or I've heard accounts of, you know, somebody showing up, uh, you know, that uh, and talking to somebody and then disappearing, you know, they oh, turn yeah. around yeah. and that person's not there anymore. And all of right. these things, you know, I, I just think it's 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 really interesting when you think very hard about the relationship and the overlap of these sort of ancient, lesser known ideas of essentially spiritual hierarchies that are all done through the idea of saints and stuff like that. And then the idea of the control system 
um, a la sort of Jacques Vallée. And I'm not surprised now that you get people like his protégés, you know, Diana Walsh Pasulka and Valley himself. He's never shied away from his Rosicrucian side. Yeah. who really are like coming back around to this sort of, all right, spirituality or religion and the phenomena. All right. Are we going to look at this again and see where they intersect? Not that I'm saying that's the case, but it's, you know, it circles around a lot to this. And uh, I find it very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my experience, like it didn't necessarily feel like there was anything paranormal going on, but like I thoroughly checked that thing before I gave up on it. Like Mm -hmm. it wasn't like, oh, it's not working. And I just pulled it out. You know, I pulled it out. I left it out for a few minutes to reset it, uh, plugged it back in. There was no power. Tried it in a different cigarette lighter, no power. And I'm just like, oh, and as soon as I came out of that Walmart, I went, I bet if I try that, it's going to work, but I'm not going to mess with it right now. Because I, th- I think I'd already put the other one in and I started driving when it occurred to me that I was like, I'll bet you that other one's going to work now. And I got home, put it in, and it freaking worked. Yeah. What if what if a tiny spirit gremlin went in there and like, did, you know, made it not work for a little while yeah. to make sure that you would help that woman <laughs> and that further on that woman is going to help somebody that's going to save the world? Yeah, who knows? You know, yeah. I mean, I don't think it's always necessarily for good. It's just that I don't, that, I don't No, that, that, it, 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 it might not be. It's really uh, funny. Like there's not to harp again on all these old Sufi adages, but there's this, this one story that's told that I, you know, I think it's told across a lot of actual religions. Cause it's about, I actually think it's told in Christianity about Gabriel and, um, uh, Moses or something like that. I, I could be wrong anyway, but within it, there are, you know, essentially this angel or in, in one version, an angel and one, another version, it's this sort of, you know, agent, uh, they, you know, in, they kill this like person in one thing. And they're like, why'd you kill this young boy? And they're like, Oh, they're going to grow up to be this horrible tyrant. And then there's this other one where they're like, Oh, you removed this, you know, the angel removes a brick from a wall so that, uh, these invaders can get in. But, uh, the reason why they did that is because, you know, the invaders were going to free all these people that were in there. Anyway, these old sort of like mythological spiritual adages are very clear about these not being all beneficial acts. These are like they're adjustments of the universe to make it go in a particular direction right. that is neither good nor bad. Well, um, I mean, that's right. the, that's the concept of Dharma. Exactly. It's it's yep. right action, not as in right or wrong, but it's the thing right. that needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, I, there's some, some overlap when you hear, uh, I don't know, very classic sort of abductee, um, uh, accounts of how their people interact with some of, you know, these beings. It's that the the idea, and again, it could be the person's mindset that's giving them a negative or a positive uh, sort of experience, but whatever the outcome ends up being, um, yeah, it's not always a positive or negative experience uh, in, in most of these paranormal uh, encounters. I mean, there's nothing sort of, again, besides the like, I don't know, what is it, the, uh, the Brazilian, um, the you chupas, you know, oh. besides like that or... Mm-hmm. Trying to think of some of the other, like where people really got uh, hurt in some way. It's all fairly minor stuff that ends yeah, up influencing yeah. people in these, you know, philosophical, spiritual, lifestyle ways. Yeah. Well, well, I will say this woman was incredibly sweet. Yeah. And mm-hmm. So you know, at least it wasn't someone who was rude or you know, like you know, whatever. Yeah. She was. She was That's a good. really nice la- lady, and uh, I just didn't want to scare her. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. like I said, I was on my way to a concert. I mean, the masks I, yeah. I will still occasionally wear because I like them. Come from yeah. black craft cults, so you know the one I usually wear has Leviathan cross on it, and yeah, I probably I like had some one. some satanic metal shirt on or something, you know. And <laughs> and here I am running up, and and I think it was cold, so I had my big trench coat on and everything else, and I'm like, don't don't scare her, don't scare her, don't scare her, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and she wasn't and she wasn't like an old I love that, and, I love and, that image. And, and she was younger yeah. you know she wasn't old or anything but still I'm, I'm a big guy to be coming running up on you going hey 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 you know so um, you but, know and maybe she needed to also uh have something done for her in a positive light with someone that uh was dressed and yes. carrying themselves like you too soraya 
that 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 is something I like to do mm-hmm. to break people's expectations. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, exactly. I I'm with you on that. So, all right, let's see. What else do we got here? Uh, my tablet went to sleep. Okay, so that one we just did. All right. So this one, this one's a little odd. Is this the odd one? Um, okay, no, I know which one this is. Okay, uh, so they said, I don't know if you remember me, but I submitted a very short story some weeks ago regarding my mother seeing an angel-type apparition at the foot of her bed one afternoon in Spain. I also love that these stories come from all over the world. Uh, well, I have another story which also comes from her. <clears throat> my own background is that I've never seen or experienced anything out of the ordinary, and my family is mostly the same except for my mother, who has had many supernatural experiences in her life. As you can imagine, it's difficult for me to accept the things she has told me, but knowing her as I do, I also have no reason to doubt her. She's a quiet and timid person, has never tried to make any money from what she has experienced, and the only people she's ever told are her own children. Anyway, um, yeah, we're just going to skip that part. Okay. The series of events occurred in the 1960s Spain when my mother was a teenager and living with my grandparents. They lived on the top floor of a block of flats, and it was a nice enough place to live. This story concerns a chance encounter my grandmother had with the neighbors that lived below. She was a woman of about 40 who lived with her daughter around 20. They were both known in the area as being rather strange, even sinister, and for always wearing black clothing. Well, this is kind of appropriate, following up what we just said. Um, Right. (laughs) This was not uncommon among women who had lost their husbands, but neither of them were widowers and black gloves even in the summer. And of course, this is the 1960s, um, should remind everyone. So that is, you know, not traditional in any way, shape or form back then. Uh, One day, my grandmother met the older woman on the stairs as she was going up and the neighbor invited her in for a chat. My grandmother was frankly frightened of her, but in the interest of being a good neighbor, accepted. When she went in. They bid her sit at the main table, and after a chat about religion and spirituality, they told her they'd show show her how to contact the spirits. In Catholic Spain at the time, this was pretty unusual, and as they were bringing candles into the room, my grandmother stood up quickly and made excuses and left. A few days later, the woman from below again met my grandmother on the stairs and asked if she'd like to come in and start up from where they left off, at which my grandmother said no and told the woman that she was sorry, but she didn't believe in those kind of things. This time, the woman appeared to be offended and said something, but my grandmother was already going up the stairs in a hurry, her unwillingness to spend any more time with her apparent. Some weeks passed without any further issues until one evening where my mother and her parents were in the small front room, as they called it, listening to the radio. It was the closing of the day and everyone was relaxed when suddenly the colossal sound of an impact reverberated through the house. It had unmistakably come from a large dining room, which was rarely used except when friends of the family visited. My grandfather rushed to the room, not knowing what to expect, and was met by the sight of a completely collapsed dining table on the floor, its splintered legs sticking out at wide angles, and the surface now bearing a large curved dent. It was a big table, solidly made, and had only recently been purchased, yet there it was, looking for all intents and purposes as if some heavy weight had landed on it from above. Shaken, but as a lo- at a loss to what happened, my grandparents set about cleaning the area. The next day, as my grandmother was once again going up the stairs, the woman was there, as if she had been waiting for her. My grandmother said nothing and passed her, but as she did, the woman said, You believe now, don't you? This caused my grandmother to become frightened and leave the house. And when my grandfather was told what transpired, he, he had some extremely stern words with the woman. In the end, both she and her daughter moved out some months later to the release of, uh, relief of other neighbors, including my own family. But even then, it took my grandmother some time before she found the courage to take up a more normal life. From what my mother tells me, the house was never really the same again after that incident. It always seemed to have a somewhat sinister aspect to it, sightings of a dark figure on the bend of the corridor on occasion, and some further strange incidents including flickering lights, and a distressing moment where my mother couldn't pass the hallway due to some kind of invisible barrier, which at last relented and let her through. But my grandfather refused to allow these things to affect them. And they lived there for the next 20 years, mostly happy, but with some odd occurrences in the background now and then. Interesting. I mean, uh, some people do have the ability to cause, you know, psychokinetic energy and control it. 
Yeah. I wonder what the woman meant, though, by you believe me now. Like, is is the inference there that she did that as right. some sort of malevolent gesture to, like, Maybe, or, prove it? Or just proof or, in general? I mean, that's if you're going to prove to someone you have supernatural abilities, I mean, smashing their dining room table w- with magic would certainly do it. It would do it, but that's a, it's a really a great, like that's, I don't know. Yeah, no, it is. Impressive. It is like, you know, there seems like there could be easier ways to do that that would go noticed without uh, doing that kind of damage. But so it makes me wonder if the woman was she, if there was another force there that she was picking up on or I, I don't know. I'm just, yeah, it's curious point about the story <clears throat> yeah that's where i went chris because i was wondering if either that happened and it was something that she the the the, the woman in black was either aware of or related to her in some way so she knew that it happened um but she wasn't the person that caused it that could be certainly yeah 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 um, the invisible barrier thing is interesting too yeah yeah I'd love to hear more about that. But that, and what's interesting too is that sounds like that wasn't something that happened close to when the the, the yeah. table shattering was. Right. Yeah. It seemed much uh, later on. Yeah. So there's. I, I don't know. You know, it, it's interesting to talk about places that get uh, that that start to have uh, poltergeist esque uh, 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 phenomena, I guess, happening, but they're work before a certain time yeah, or yeah. new or whatever. You know, and, and we've talked about this a lot because I agree with you. I tend to associate that with a person or persons when things are going on in their lives. Yeah. But for something like that to happen and then continue um, okay. is go, go ahead. I was going to say the area could be charged. Yeah, that's true, too. Um, it may just need the right combination of, you know, the area being charged and somebody's uh, mind to uh, um, ignite it, so to speak. And there, and there could also be the wandering spirit that uses that energy too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I mean, I, I I feel like there's there's <clears throat> there's multiple sides to it. Like you have some areas that are just power areas. Yeah. So maybe a place like Sedona, Skinwalker Ranch, or you know whatever, uh, Bridgewater mm-hmm. Triangle. These areas have something odd about them that cause an uptick in unusual activity, especially when sensitive people are there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you have sensitive people. Who can make any area, you know, odd because they're generating that pe- that that sort of unconscious PK energy. Yep. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then if you mix the two together, yeah, um, yeah, I was, and it could be that too that you know, it could be to think of it in a that like a non-local way. Um, in that there are a lot of accounts, I think of the idea of the other world or the other side or whatever you want to call it, or maybe the multiple things that are out there as not, you know, having time work in the same way or space. Yeah. So Mm. it could be that in the same way that, you know, Whitley Strieber insists that when he does his sensing exercises, that you become a beacon for what he calls the visitors, you know, that maybe if the woman was doing, you know, sort of a uh, occult seance, spiritualist work or whatever it was um, in the, was it the lower apartment, uh, yeah. the lower floor? Yeah, lower maybe floor. that, you know, maybe that called something there that's yeah, like trying have. to like work stuff out or trying being like, you called me here. What's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah exactly. So there is, and I highly recommend this. On Jeremy Vaney's channel, our undoing radio, he put up a, I believe it's a 2010 interview with Jacques Vallée. That, uh, so you have Jeff, Jeff Ritzman, J- Jeremy Vaney, and Jacques Vallée. You're not going to go wrong with that combination. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, and it's a fascinating conversation. It's right after uh, Wonders in the Sky came out that he co-authored with Chris Aubeck. And from oh, the sounds yeah, of it, uh, uh, Chris did most of the work and Jacques helped. Uh, either that or Jacques being very humble. Um, but it is an absolute must listen to because it is, it is the best Jacques Valet. And not that I've heard a ton of valet interviews, but it is by far the best one I've ever heard. Um, but at some point in there, they talked to him about, he at, at sometime in the nineties decided he was going to try and create a skinwalker ranch type situation. Okay. So, and I had forgotten all about this and I, I don't remember one of those guys brought it up and Jacques said, yeah. He he bought he had this piece of land and they did stuff to try and promote weird activity and I I don't remember if he actually said what they did. He said overall they got a couple of results but nothing really impressive. 
He's like, it was a nice place to live, though, so it was fine. Mm. But that was his experiment. <laughs> Let's see if we can yeah. turn this into a hot spot. Yeah, yeah. I remember vaguely hearing something about that, too. Yeah, I forget. Huh. I mean, it, the idea it, is, is, is kind of a phenomenal. I mean, it's a great idea. I yes, don't, yeah. in theory. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is. You know. it, you know, uh, what Jeff, I think on, on uh, this show, Soraya talked about going to the same place every night for a week and meditating. And like, it's like, if you want right. weird stuff to happen, like do that. Like weird oh, stuff. I happen. still remember when I first heard that the first time I was like, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah it makes sense. And it, it, it kind of makes me think of like, well, you're, you're sort of uh, altering that area a little bit by that continuous uh, repetition, you know? Yep. Yep. Um, actually, I had a couple of dreams about Jeff recently. I'll talk about that in the Patreon, though. Okay. Um, I got one more listener story here and then some other stuff I want to cover. So uh, let me go through. I think there's only one left here. Oh, yes. Uh, no, there's two more. Okay. This is a short, this is a short, weird one. Uh, but I've had stuff like this happen and like it, it uh, okay, I'll just read it. Um, uh, sure. I'll read it when I can figure out where I want to start. Okay. I'd like to share one of the stranger things that have, has occurred in my own life. Uh, I was working for a chiropractic assistant in 2009 to 2010 for a sole proprietor. The doctor was notorious for his strange personality, very brusque and rude with staff and clients alike. A petite, delicately built man with sharp, hawkish nose and dark, beady eyes, he used the same script to talk to all of his clients, day in and day out, repeating the same off-collar canned jokes, as if he didn't know how to authentically connect. His cruelty and inhumane treatment of staff had earned him a reputation with all the local hiring and labor law entities, yet despite my distaste for his personality, I will admit that he was an excellent chiropractor. I say this to frame that he, he was already a suspicious character. His wife worked in the office as well, doing the books, and it seemed to be, and she also seemed to be just kind of out of touch. There were rumors that the pair were into some kind of dark BDSM and were perhaps extending their dynamic to the office. My story uh, was on an ordinary office day. I'd been on a health kick, so I had switched from my ordinary break time coffee to green tea a few weeks prior. I went to prepare my tea, as was now habitual by dispensing water from the cooler into a mug and microwaving the water to heat it up. I set my mug in for the customary two minutes, pulled it out at the chime, plucked the tea bag I had opened while uh, the water boiled into my mug of coffee, cream, and sugar. I was so rattled, I felt dizzy, faint. I had to go sit down outside and collect myself. I was deeply disturbed. I, had already sus I was already suspicious about the doctor and his missus. Uh, weren't what they appeared to be. They seemed uncomfortable in their skins. Now I was borderline frightened. I looked at them with new suspicion. I never told them what happened. I didn't want them to know I was onto them. What did happen? Did I go missing and get reinserted in a time a little bit off? Did I change dimensions, glitch in the matrix? That incident lit a fire under my ass to get out, and I had a new job within a week. So, oh, interesting. So they put tea yeah. in and took coffee out. Yeah. And I feel like I've had <laughs> things like that happen where I just look at it and go, that's not right. Yeah. And then I usually just assume it must be me. It's like, I must have, I must have done that, I guess, unconsciously. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, or maybe you needed coffee. <laughs> maybe you need coffee. Yeah. Well, in this case, maybe they need to change their job. That's yes. Mm, I mean, I, I like certainly have had some, uh, you know, some of the most powerful sort of sigil work I've ever done was, uh, in, getting out of a job that I needed to get out of that I was stuck in. And it, it worked in ways that I didn't think it was going to, but it, it worked. Well, in this case, you know, they were clearly, you know, not too happy with the people running the place. Yeah. Um, but we're staying there until that happened. And then they decided to quit. So yeah. maybe it was the universe's way of just saying, or even they're unconscious, yeah. you know, changing this, you know, well, that's, tea to I coffee mean, to freak them out so that they had an excuse they to get leave. out of there. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing about, you know, even like looking at sigil work is that, you know, there's a really, you know, valid argument to be made that maybe it works in a non-magical way and that it's a really powerful you know, um, psychological, uh, uh, like un, uh, uh, a subconscious, uh, trigger, you know, and that's part of it. I and mean, that's part of what spare was talking about. And that I, I, you know, he, he really, you know, didn't, I don't think that 
Again, I'm no spare expert, but, you know, in my understanding of him, he really didn't even feel like there was a huge difference between the subconscious and, you know, uh, like the, something more like the oversoul. And there's a argument right, to be right. made for that as you just look two different ways of looking at it. So inserting something symbolic in there that's working is sort of like a background subroutine, um, you know can have some really serious results. I mean, people try to do that all the time to themselves, psych themselves out, put in subconscious, you know, uh, 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 suggestions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never thought about, um, those, I'm going to call it a change being, um, sort of a, a, a supernatural experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I kind of wish I had now because, uh, I've had that happen to me a few times in my life, and I just assumed that I was getting older. <laughs> and uh, what what kind of change? Oh, either like I'm trying to think of a specific incident, but um, that's one of the reasons I don't fly as much anymore either, is because okay. I like things look one way, and then later they'll look different, and I yeah. can't decide if something's changed or if my observation has just gotten worse as I've gotten older. Gotcha. I mean, okay. I, I have been hit in the head a lot. So, yeah, I, I, I resemble that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I mean, there was, I don't know if I ever told the story, this story on this show. I was, I was actually driving to G Geneva, uh, which is about a half hour North of where I am. And I'm going through this park, uh, the Samson park there. And I was, the, the guy in front of me was one of these guys who's doing like 60 and then 40 and then 60 and then 40. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, come on. And so we got to a straightaway and I looked and I didn't see anything coming. So I floored it. Mm -hmm. And as I started to go, there was a car coming the other way. Oh, wow. And so the car coming the other way kind of like slowed down and pulled over to the side. The guy I was passing slowed down and pulled over to the side and I zipped in between them because I also started to slow down. But then the guy next to me is slowing down, so that's not helping. So I, I gunned right. it and just got in front of him, and I'm like, oh, my God, how did I? I looked. Like, I looked right. Your brain doesn't always process this stuff. That's the thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Yes. And Very I, true. Two, like 30 seconds later, cop lights behind me. Oh, Jesus. Yep. And I'm like, yep. okay, of course. Yeah. And I pull over, and I'm like about to pull my stuff out. He's knocking on my window. And I'm like, and I rolled down the window and he's like, what were you thinking? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I looked, I didn't process. There was a car there until I started to go. And he's yeah. like, he's like all shaken up. And he's like, I, you, that could have been really bad. I'm like, I, I know. He's yeah. like, okay, okay, just be more careful. And then he left. Yeah. And I'm, just, and I'm just like, wait, that's it. You're not going to give me a yeah. ticket, you know? Cause I'm he sure shook him up enough that he was just like. <laughs> Just glad you're okay. Yeah, okay. pretty much. Well, I think yeah. you could tell I was a little shaken up too, that I wasn't just be, you know, just hot rodding it around the guy, you know? Right. 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 But yeah. I mean, this happens, you know, you look it and does. your brain no, just totally doesn't does. process. I mean, they talk about that in the invisible gorilla. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there's an incident where a cop is where they're chasing this guy. Um, and oh, how, how did the story go? Uh, Cause it became a big, a big case. So they were chasing this one perp who I think was black and an off-duty cop who was also black jumped in on the chase trying to, to catch this guy. I forget what the guy did. Um, one of the other cops not realizing that this wasn't that this off-duty cop was the yeah. off-duty cop and thinking he was the perp had grabbed him and thrown him and was beating on him on the ground. Yep. Oh my gosh. And yep. this other cop went right by this chasing the original perp and never saw that. Mm. So, mm -hmm. you know, when they brought him to trial and they're like, did you see this happening? He's like, no, but he, he admitted, he's like, I, I should have, I went right by it. I think it, you know, I believe it happened, but I don't have any recollection of seeing it. And they're talking about this as the illusion of focus that we think we, we observe our entire, entire environment. But this guy was so focused on the actual perp he was chasing that he didn't see what was going on right next to him. Mm -hmm. I totally believe that though. I'm still suspect because that's a cop and. You know, <laughs> right. <laughs> but but uh, yes, you're you're completely right. I mean, it's and I've been in that situation myself when I've you know not had that focus to notice something like that. Yeah, you know, we think we think we notice everything. We notice very very little. Our brain is kind of like none of this is important. This is the thing you need to see. Yeah. You know, I mean that yeah. that's where the whole invisible gorilla thing comes from. Is yeah. you know focusing on the people passing the basketball and you don't see the guy in the gorilla suit. 
which yeah. you would think you would notice a guy in a gorilla suit walking between some basketball yeah. players, but you don't because your brain doesn't work like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that quote again from, uh, from the new John dies at the end book talking about how we don't remember 99.9% of our lives, which is true. Our memories just, they don't work like yes. that. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and we will be back with one more listener story. Quick mid show break here, some quick contact info and a recommendation. Anything you want can be found at where the road go.com. That's where did the road go related. So emails and everything else can be found there. If you want to submit a story for a future listener story show, uh, stories at where did the road go.com. Again, you can find it on the website as well as links to all our social media uh, snail mail address and, um, Patreon. Yeah. Our Patreon, which for only $3 a month, you get extra content every single week or pretty much every week, sometimes more than once a week, actually. So, uh, as for recommendations show, I just found this week came out a couple of years ago. Uh, looks like it ran in uh, late 2021. It was called what happened in Skinner. And it's, uh, it's very well done. Someone had posted that it reminded them of things like the black tapes, and I would agree. I'm not sure there's anything paranormal going on on it, but it's uh, it's about a cult and a murder and some other weird stuff, and I am thoroughly enjoying it. I'm only, I don't know, three episodes in maybe, but uh, enough so to say that I really like it, and I don't, I don't know if it ends per se, so it goes up to 15 episodes. I don't know. Yeah, I'm on episode four. I don't know if there's an ending, so I hope there is, because uh, that came out uh, January 2022, so quite a while ago, but I, I mean, I guess I could be doing another season. I guess I'll I'll find out, but I definitely recommend it. Very well done, has kept me very interested in the story, so check that out. What happened in Skinner? All right, back to where did the road go? All right, I'm here with Mr. Christopher Ernst and Super hello. Saxon Man. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, that new name, thanks to uh, Matt Festa. <laughs> Actually, I got I got a comment from Matt I wanted to read before we get to the last story. The last one's a little long here. Um, but uh, And this is the thing. Matt, Matt says he has nothing to add, and then he sends me these really interesting comments after he listens to a show. He said, random thought listening to the Suzanne Chancellor episode. I've heard so many experiencers describe the symbols, writing, whatever you want to call it, as hieroglyphics. What sort of makes sense as just a reference point and visual shorthand to get the gist across of what they're seeing. But I wonder if any actual linguists, specifically ancient linguistic specialists, have ever been experiencers and could describe in detail what they've seen. Or, since the doubt and unknowing seems to be such an integral part of the phenomena, if since they'd have that specialized knowledge, would they mean would that mean that they would have uh, would mean they wouldn't have visual language as part of their experience? Wouldn't have visual language as part right. of their experience. So, so because they might be able to describe the hieroglyphics in detail or recognize mm-hmm. an ancient language, that's why they wouldn't see it. Interesting. You know, huh. the, the self hmm. the, self yeah. self negating yep. of the phenomena. Yeah. You know, when when I was doing anthropology in college, you know, there was a, a, a move away from trying to be objective and knowing that you couldn't be to basically like centering yourself and everything because there was impossible to separate your perception from the culture that you were documenting or, or yeah. you know, trying right. to, to explain or, or, or share. And so, you know, anthropology would say you could never completely assimilate in another culture, but you could see it changing perspectives and how people would put these ethnographies together. And so I think even if you had a a strong linguist, I, I almost think having the broader selection of languages might make it where you could experience more strangeness Um, because it, it's just because something doesn't fit into one language, you know, even if you know, say, you know, something that's very old and archaic and uh, just bizarre, you know, now you've got that different category of space in your mind to put something in or to view something through. Uh, so I actually think it would yeah. be more likely. Mm. And different languages, if, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think that, you know, different languages, depending on the nature of the language, 
sort of structure the way that people organize and think about reality in different ways. So the way in which, say, uh, you know, kanji in Japanese, the, you know, sent, you know, the subject gender there are slight differences that sort of structure the reality in which you know you that you create by naming what's around you in a different way true oh for sure and, and, and you're you're spot on chris because you know one of the things in my linguistics classes which i only took two of them so and i'm by no means an expert but you know we would talk about um sentence structure as particularly languages that don't have a concept of the past and present and how they uh talk Sure. So that changes things. And then, you know, some languages and I've talked about this on the show before, too, their their sentence structure is actually quite loose and and a a lot more you know, open. And so uh, uh, particularly like with the aboriginal languages in Australia, the indigenous people there, there's two interesting things that happen with their language. One is there's not really a defined like grammar. So you can put things in all kinds of orders. Um, But they don't have terms for like left and right. They're spatial. Right. Is, yes. You know, off of uh, north, south, east, and west. Um, but if you compare that to like some of the uh, languages in China, you know, they've got very specific ways that they group things together. If you got them to describe like everything on a table, like there's an apple and a glass of water and a sandwich, they might group things by shape. And then you would look at the uh, someone from Australia that's indigenous and they might say, well, the, you know, apples to the north, the glass of waters to the east and the sandwiches in the southwest. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it's yeah. wild how that works. Um, but the, the biggest thing I got out of it is even though we have words that are equivalent, they're they're only equivalent. Even. Yep. Yeah. They're, they're not truly a direct translation. Right. You know, everything's yep. just an equivalent, even when it means the same thing. It really doesn't. Yeah. And that's why I, you know, just to go on a very quick tangent, anybody who is reading ancient tomes of wisdom translated probably from two to three languages. Yeah. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, there's a game of telephone maybe going on there. Just something to keep in mind. Yeah. If you're reading, I mean, I, I say this very, you know, about the Vedas, about, you know, uh, the Zoroastrian, you know, uh, Vesta, about the Bible. About, you know, um, uh, the the Emerald Tablets of Toth, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, a a fun place to look at that now in a a contemporary context, too, is to look at, like, music or poetry that's translated from, like, Spanish into English. Yep. There's there's a lot of idiomatic expressions, and the good news is they're both accessible languages, so you can kind of see where, like, you know, the the flexibility and the meaning might be a little different than you actually thought it was. Right. Um, And so that's something that if anybody wants to check that out, they can find examples of uh, pretty readily, and then you can carry that over to something like, you know, the the Vitas, and, and it's like... What? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know? well, I, I had posted this oh back in June. Uh, the gulf of meaning between the terms horseplay and pony play illustrates why <laughs> expecting your <laughs> culture's translation of another's ancient text to be a hundred percent true to the original intent is dangerous and probably not a good idea. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> I just assume anytime I read something in English that was not written in English, I am getting uh, 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 the best approximation that somebody could come up with, but in no way accurate. Right. All right. So we got one more story here to get through for tonight. And uh, this one is uh, about a bunch of different weird stuff that this woman experienced. So she said, uh, she did send me some uh, photos of this graveyard that's located in her hometown of Harrison, Ohio. The graveyard is St. John the Baptist Cemetery, located on New Biddington Road. It does not show up on Google Maps when you zoom in. Across the street is another graveyard, uh, Glen Haven. That is where my family is buried. The Miami Whitewater Forest is located near town, and Little Miami River runs through it. I have spent a lot of time in the forest. My high school senior photo was taken in that forest. As long as I can remember, there is no wildlife in the forest. No deer, no squirrels, and I've never seen any birds. And it's kind of like when we were at Connecticut Hill, uh, Saxon. <laughs> 
At times it is eerily right. silent. There we go. I have driven <laughs> I have driven through to look for squirrel and bird nests and trees during the late autumn. There were none and I could uh none I could see. This is common yeah. knowledge to anyone who has grown up in Harrison. I know a young guy I used to work with whose mother has a house on the forest property line. He and his friends had an encounter in the forest where they experienced strange balls of light and high metallic or I'm sorry, and metallic high pitched sounds coming from the creek. They ran in all directions and called the police. His mother sees balls of light in the forest from her house. He can verify his encounters if anyone wants to speak with him. Okay. Um she thinks she said she I feel the forest qualifies for an in-depth paranormal investigation. Um when I grew up in Harrison, it was an idyllic small farming town community. I was in kindergarten when we moved there, early nineteen sixties. I was five years old until I was in my late twenties. We lived in my grandparents' farm outside of town on Flora Road off Carolina Trace until my divorced mother rented a historic 200-year-old house in town. My siblings and I attended St. John Baptist School in town. My mother took a job at the town's newspaper, the Harrison Press. I was mostly raised by my grandparents and lived between summers on the farm and our house in town during the school years. The town and house looked nothing much like it did when I was growing up. Our farm was located on a dead-end road with mostly farmers, a few mid-century homes, and a massive amount of forestry. My grandparents' property backed up to the border of Indiana, which was a large amount of forestry. The farmer at the end of the road had a huge farm and raised cattle and bulls. When I was five years old and experiencing alien and paranormal activity in our house in town, uh, mm. When I was around the same age and older, I was experiencing paranormal activity at our farm. I kept this to myself for a long time out of fear and not understanding what was happening. It was on our farm in the woodlands that I had my Bigfoot encounter. I believe I might have been six or seven years old. It's hard to remember my exact age, but I try to associate with what was going on at the time. I was five years old when we moved to Harrison. It would have been 1964. I thought what I was seeing at the time was a monkey with a baby. I did share my setting with my grandparents the same day. The following day, uh, the following day, or a few days later, I came upon a branch constructed teepee in our tra- on our trail in the woods. There was occasional wood knocking in the forest at night during the summers. One night, I told my grandparents I couldn't sleep because someone was in the woods with a hammer beating on a tree. My grandfather mm. got out of bed, got a rifle, and went into the woods. There were no shots <laughs> fired, but the hammering stopped. Uh, I have a cousin who once showed me a small newspaper article about a priest that was sent to our historic house in town to perform an exorcism long after we have moved out. There was a man living at that house who was found dead at the dining room uh, dining room table with both his wrists slit, and it was claimed to be from an accident from a broken beer bottle. Mm. The exorcism news was prior to the death inside of the house. Uh, my eldest sister and her friends used to have seances with a Ouija board and she was when she was in high school in the 1970s. There's a good reason why I was having so many experiences in that house. They must gravitate to the youngest child to attach and spook. Uh, my encounters with aliens, poltergeists, and the paranormal had continued throughout my life. I had also experienced heightened psychic abilities and precognitive dreams. I mean, that all these things really, as we know, kind of go together. Uh, right, not, yeah, not that unusual. Yeah. Um, I had nosebleeds. My eldest son and I had an alien encounter together when I was, when he was five years old, we were living in an apartment near town on the banks of the little Miami river. My son began drawing pictures of aliens using ufology terminology that no five-year-old would ever know about. Uh, that is when I began to have night terrors, which continued well into my forties. When I was 32 years old, I had missing time while I was driving. I had an unbelievable poltergeist activity almost everywhere we lived. We did move often for this reason. I moved a year and a half ago because the poltergeist activity in my apartment. I lived there eight years. My neighbors in the building were also having poltergeist activity, and they ended up moving out too. Shortly after I had moved in, one of the neighbors told me that his wife saw an alien in their apartment. They were a young couple. She was a hairdresser. He was a musician. There was some dark energy inside that building. It was strange because I didn't notice any activity until I was there uh, a few years. It got to be really bad. Uh, I've had so much poltergeist activity that I've almost gotten used to it. There are too many stories to tell. Um, and she has been on Strange Familiars talking about this, too. Okay. Uh, let's see. That's good, because there's a, I, there was a, I found under a 
Bigfoot case files. There was a Miami Whitewater Forest uh, sighting in 95. Mm, okay. Very interesting. Uh, I was a semi-functioning autistic child. I'm a functioning autistic adult now. My family origin is Irish. I was uh, raised with traditional Irish upbringing. During the 70s and 80s, our small town, everyone in our small town, everyone still held on to their ancestral traditions, Irish or German farming families. I went everywhere with my grandfather because I had struggled with autism. He could handle me better than my birth mother. I was close to my grandparents. I was especially close to my grandmother. She was an Irish psychic, an empath, a healer, a shaman. She had precognitive visions. She used to feed wildlife from her hands. She would take me outside to the porch every full moon and tell me never to believe what I was told about the moon, which I just find huh. really interesting. I love that. I do, too. <sighs> I would drive to town with my grandfather in the backseat of his Ford Falcon. It was the mid-century 1960s. Behind the cemetery lived a scary man. His name was Lester. He lived in a shack back along a gravel road. It was hardly a road. Lester drove an old 1930s, 1940s putrid green wagon. I'm not sure of the model, but the vehicle was odd. He had a big axe in the rear window. The outside of his car was covered in all sizes of mirrors, just like the mirrors on the scooter of the rock band The Who's Quadrophonia. Is it Quadrophonia or Fenia uh, album? Quadrophenia. Okay. Uh, it was covered with mirrors. He would drive through town yelling obscenities at all the women and girls. We would see him coming, and we would run and hide so he couldn't see us. He, was, uh, he wasn't like at all like the Boo character in To Kill a Mockingbird. Lester was scary and most likely dangerous. The story back then is he had accidentally shot and killed his brother while they were hunting. I've heard that story was not true from certain high school friends when I got older. Uh, he had some kind of a sickness, most likely schizophrenia. Driving around town terrorizing girls doesn't make you the harmless, uh, cuddly man who lives behind the freaking graveyard in the woods. When Sounds my, like a creep. Yeah. When my grandfather and I would drive into town, my grandfather would take Lester eggs from our chickens and booze. My grandfather would never tell me he was going to drive back behind the graveyard because he knew I didn't like to go anywhere near Lester. When he pulled up to the gravel trail next to the graveyard, I would beg him to let me off the graveyard so I could sit and wait for him. I would rather have waited with the dead folk than go back to Lester's shack. He would never let me get out. My grandfather would get out of the car. I would lock all the car doors, roll up all the windows. This was the dog days of summer. I was suffocating inside the Falcon while he spoke with Lester. I was so afraid he was going to kill my grandfather with that axe and then come get me out of the locked car. Huh. They have a guardrail. And, and why wouldn't he just let her out of the car? I don't. Yeah. They have a guardrail that hides the old gravel trail next to the graveyard so no one can drive back there now. Um, there's an old, <clears throat> old barbed wire fence in the graveyard that I climbed a few years ago. And then I got spooked off and hightailed it through those woods. I had my cell phone in my hands and didn't realize that it was snapping photos while I was in the thicket. <clears throat> there are only a few photos, but there are really odd orbs with color. There was no color in the woods, only green and trees and bushes in the orb looking images. I do see a man with dark hair, wearing a white shirt, a lady's fingernail, a face, the last orb-looking photo I see outlines of human images. I think it's strange there are no visible trees or bushes in the images. Uh, I did not take photos of anything else, and there was nothing on my cell camera that matches anything like the orb photos, no double exposures or anything. Uh, she did send me the photos, and, and it's hard to really tell what you're looking at. It might, um, mm -hmm. it might just be out of focus. I mean, cameras do weird things. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So it's not proof one way or the other, unfortunately, of anything. But, uh, I mean, I can't exactly explain them either. So they are, they are what they are. Um, so I will include photos I took at a friend's house a year ago when I was having activity inside her house. I was there alone with her small dog. Her house is surrounded by forest with a creek close by her house. Three times I had had a strange, strange experiences inside of her house. I happened to snap a photo of her porch door. When I got home to look at the photo, it appeared to be an alien figure at the porch door. Her dog was oh. petrified and freaking out during the three times I had experiences inside of her house. I am a <laughs> magnet to this type of activity, and so are my two sons. They have their own stories of encounters. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, the, like, like I said, activity like this does tend to cluster around people. If you have one experience, you're probably sure. going to get some of the other ones, too. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
And at the same time, I'd be curious to know about that area there. I mean, that's in Ohio, I think, right? And that's, I wish Barbara was here. She might know more about that. Oh, but that's, that's a good like, point. That's, uh, you know, I mean, that's that's an area where stuff happens, you know, um, that like in between, uh, I think it, if I remember, I'm looking at a map. Now. Yeah, it's to the like west of Cincinnati. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So, so much of uh, all of this reminds me of how I grew up and even like the, the, the you know, obviously I didn't have the Bigfoot sighting when I was a kid, but the telling the, uh, was the father or grandfather about somebody who was outside, like knocking, uh, using a hammer yeah. all night. Like, you know, that reminds me of hearing the guy in the kitchen play harmonica all night long and nobody else hearing it, you know, and going to my parents' room. I mean, I was like four or five and like, you know, telling them what was going on and they couldn't hear it and they would tell me to go back to bed. And so I would just cry because it wouldn't stop. Right. Um, right. But, you know, even down to like the Irish influence and stuff like that, although nobody told me to disregard the moon, but like... (laughs) Well, you not know. disregard. She she said, "Don't don't believe anything they don't tell you about it." Don't believe what they tell you about it. Yeah, I love that, yeah. man. But uh, yeah, I'm like, oh man, this is all like mm, interesting. <laughs> Very similar experiences. Like, I feel like we'd have a lot to talk about. Um, what was the other thing about that I was going to mention? Uh, I completely lost it. Yeah, the moon thing threw me off. Because <laughs> that's just I don't know. That's just like a creepy folklorish sort of. Yeah. You know, the, oh, I was going to say, I mean, she says everywhere she goes, she's getting poltergeist activity. Well, it's probably her energy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then especially yeah. if she's going somewhere that also, again, like we just talked about, if you're going somewhere that also has energy, you're just amping that up. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Whether it's directly coming from a part of you or if it's the spirit picking it up and using it either way, it, it's it's right. probably your energy being put out there one way or the other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So and that and that seems to run in families. I mean, that's the other thing. Oh, it absolutely runs in families. Yeah. Yeah. On top of the, you know, the all of the abductee family stuff that right. seems to be more than just coincidence. Yeah. Well, and even when it comes to abductees and stuff, I mean, when we take the uh when we take the alien trope off of it, yeah. then it makes a lot more sense that it runs in families. Right. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. also mm-hmm. speaking of paratopia. Um, I listened, there's an uncensored ver, uh, episode with the woman, and I forget her name off the top of my head. She was the subject of intruders. Oh, okay. Sure. That, I don't remember her name either. That, yeah. It's not, I mean, it's, she's under her real name on the show, and she is okay. fantastic. She was also very happy she could swear. Yeah, because she's. A, I mean, when Jeremy was on with us, he said that uh, she never had the experience of being shown a uh, a little child that was hers or whatever. That was a dream. Yeah, and Bud neglected to say it was a dream and yep. put it out there as a real That's experience. Right. Yep. And mm-hmm. um, but she has. I mean, she doesn't really go after Bud or anything in the episode so much uh, as just the 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 UFO, the way people look at UFOs and stuff in the community. Yeah. Uh, and mm-hmm. she, you know, she doesn't want to be known as the, the woman who had the alien baby. She's like, that baby yep. was, was my boyfriend's. I know why I, you yeah. know, Bud put it out there that, that I didn't know how I got pregnant. She's like, I knew how I got pregnant. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yep. But it, it is a, it is a very, wor- that's another worthwhile interview on Paratopia to check out. Uh, it's near the end of the feed right now. Um, and it's just, uh, it's her name uncensored or something like that. It won't be that hard to find. I just can't remember uh, what it is, but she had a lot of interesting stuff to say. Uh, she was just talking about a book. Uh, she, uh, she was doing a talk. Where, where was she? She was somewhere. And the reporter f- who was part of a, some parapsychological group came over and said, Hey, why don't you do a book signing at the bookstore across the, the way? Since you have some books and, she said, you know, tons of people read Intruders. Almost nobody's read her book. And um, so she said, sure, why not? She said one creepy guy came in and that was it. Uh, and then this guy wrote up an article and the article, well, uh, Deb, Deb Cobble, that's her name. So it's Paratopia okay. 92, Deb Cobble Uncentered and it's Uncensored. Okay. Um, and that's our, our undoing radio. But uh, so he doxed her. Oh, wow. So he yeah. like published where she worked, her whole family. Oh, she lost her job because of it. Oh my gosh! So she, yeah, she had she had some stuff to rant about. Yeah, uh, she absolutely does. My gosh, 
And uh, that that was another definite must listen if you're uh, interested in this stuff because there's a lot there that I don't think most people uh, know. So mm-hmm. I did have one other UFO comment because this this amused me greatly. Um, so as I said before, Jason Colavito's kind of been you know going after the disclosure stuff and making some very good points. A couple of times he's he's not made good points, but a lot of it has been pretty decent points. And he says the first supposedly linked leaked government information about a crashed saucer appeared in Frank Scully's Behind the Flying Saucers in 1950. The ship had portholes, aliens dressed as Victorians, and paper books. Yeah. Uh, The false story prompted an FBI investigation, and so the story goes, we took the little bodies out and laid them on the ground. We examined them in their clothing. I remember one of our teams saying, that looks like the style of 1890. We examined the bodies very closely and very carefully. They were normal from every standpoint and had no appearance of being uh, what we call on this planet midgets. Mm. Uh, They were perfectly Mm. normal in their development. The only trouble was their skin seemed to be charred a very dark chocolate color. About the only thing we could decide at the time was that the charring had occurred somewhere in space and that their bodies had been burned as a result of air rushing through a broken porthole window or something going wrong with the means by which the ship was propelled and the cabin pressured. They then Mm. began an examination of the ship itself. First, they decided to take complete measurements of the ship from the outside. The skin was aluminum colored. Uh, Reports that had appeared from time to time in papers. I just lost it. It literally just disappeared. Come back. (laughs) Mm. This tablet is haunted. (laughs) Totally nothing to do with me. Uh, Reports. That had appeared from time to time in papers about these strange visitors, uh, continued Dr. G, had always been to the effect that they looked like flying saucers. With this ship on the ground, we could not help but be aware of the fact that it looked like a huge saucer, and you might almost say that there was a cup in it, because the cabin uh, uh, cabin set in an insert in the bottom of the saucer. The overall dimensions of the ship were found to be a fraction short of 100 feet in diameter, To be exact, okay, whatever. From the outer ring, yeah, we don't need all that. The portholes were located in this area. I I guess the point is there's a lot of detail there. (coughs) On getting into the ship, the doctor said the first objective was to decide, if they could, how the ship was propelled. Uh, He was first to suggest that it probably flew on magnetic lines of force. Some of his staff suggested pushing some of the buttons on what appeared to be the instrument board to find out if his suspicions were true, but all agreed after some discussion that that would be about the worst possible thing they could do because if the ship started, nobody would know which push button to push to stop it again. So the result mm. was, said Dr. G, that none of us pushed any buttons on the instrument board. There were two bucket <laughs> seats, as the doctor called them, in front of the instrument board and two little fellows sitting there. Uh, they had fallen over face down on the instrument board. Now it appeared that the ship, if flying on magnetic lines of force, must have had an automatic type of control. So when that it came in danger or when occupants were not in a position to operate the ship, it simply settled quietly to Earth. Obviously, it had already flown into our atmospheric area, uh, either on intelligence or instruments. None of us could arrive at any conclusion as to when or how the windows had broken or at what possible point in space these occupants must have been killed. The simple fact is that they were dead from either 131 burns or the bends and proceeded to further examine the interior of the ship. We found some pamphlets or booklets, which all uh, probability dealt with navigation problems. So Jason then follows up the FBI and the Air Force investigated each other's investigations on this. So, yes, there are probably going to be a lot of secret government records we didn't know about before, but most of this is most likely going to be self-referential circular investigations of investigations leading nowhere. Yeah, Yeah, right. (laughs) But here you have 1950-something sound that sounds like it's coming out of the disclosure movement now. Yeah. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, here's all the details, the leaked stuff the government doesn't want you to know. We're whistleblowing it. And that's 1950, and we're in, like, what, 2020 now? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. (laughs) It's it's tough for a lot of people, I think, to understand, (laughs) really. Not that, that, I think people who are not old like me can definitely understand this, but it's, it's not, there's not much new that's coming loud. It's, 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 uh. There's this recycled stuff 
and people get real excited about it, but it's been done before. Yep. Yep. And yeah, we, uh, we were actually having a conversation in the uh, Discord about potential legislation, and I was like, you know, uh, I, I I hope something comes of it, but sure, you know, we we uh, have had plenty of people. You know, when when whistleblowers come out and they talk about something relevant, we destroy them. Yes, I mean, yeah. let's let's be clear about that. And so, yeah. you know, when we have whistleblowers come out that seem perfectly fine, I'm yeah. always like, eh. why are they fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like why why are they okay? You know, yep. uh, they haven't felt like they needed to flee the country. They're not in prison for, you know, X number of years or anything like that. Uh, and we already know that, uh, you know, military officials feel comfortable lying in testimony oh, to, yeah. you know, because they can always go back to national security and the same thing with corporations. So if yeah. there's anything to disclose, I just don't think it's going to matter. Yeah. We'll never hear yeah. about it. And again. it's. I got to say, too, I mean, maybe there are some of these politicians that have a vested interest in, you know, releasing things to the public. But all of these folks and I mean, particularly some of the folks that are kind of uh, and I won't name names, but those who are having this as be a big part of their platform, they're they're kind of, you know, they're kooks. They're not like, you know, they're doing this for self-serving reasons. And I really don't think anybody should put any faith in yeah. any of this yeah. being done for altruistic reasons by any party. Yeah. Right. Well, nine, oh, for sure. 99% of the government does not exist to help us. Yeah. Yeah. It, it exists it, to help itself and the corporations and the rich. Yeah. And, and you know, just to add to your point, Chris, uh, particularly like everything these people say, I'm referring to politicians is rehearsed yeah. and workshopped. I mean, everything. They memorize their answers before they go to different things. They've got a whole staff that, you know, sits around and does research and finds the way to say what they want to get the result that they're looking for. So all mm -hmm. of this stuff is usually started with the end result and workshop backwards. And people, to, yeah. and people say wrestling is fake. Yeah. yeah, 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 right, right. <laughs> wrestling is honest. <laughs> exactly. Wrestling is honest, yes, exactly. And we are out of time, so people can find Chris where? Uh, go to brightrectangle.com. That'll take you where you need to go. And Super Saxon Man here is uh, floating around Discord, and where else? Uh, I'm on uh, Instagram, and I, I have started up a Threads account. So, oh, okay. Uh, but you'll have to look for Super Inframan on those instead oh. of Super Saxon Man. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. I want to give a big thank you here to everyone who supports this show by becoming a Patreon. And I want to give a special shout-out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Billuminati. Greg Ross, Leanne Cherry, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Matthew Sproul, Andrew Nichols, Christine, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy Incommunicable, Chris, Chris Cicernos, Craig Parmenter, Diane B., Empty K., Eric Todd, History and Coffee, J., J. Otto Bullet, Jack Huntington, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Mattingly, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L., Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linda, Linz Jackson K., Luke Osborne, MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Schmooples, Devourer of Mortal Souls, Oli Andre Olar, Paul Jeffries, Philosopher of Mirrors, Riker and Stark, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Seed Person One, Stacy Sherwood, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Varosh K, Vincent Trewell, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Annabelle Smith, Caroline Walker, TDT, Skunkworks, and Craig Sagastumi. Thank you all so very, very much from helping make this show possible. There is a Patreon segment to go along with this show. That will be up later in the week for patrons. And if you want to become a patron, it's only $3 a month. However, I suggest uh, signing up at the beginning of the month because it charges you at the beginning of every month. But um, 
Yeah, $3 a month gets you extra content pretty much every week, sometimes more than once a week, plus you get the shows a, a week early. All right, um, I want to welcome some new patrons. Jason Ruhl, I have no idea if I'm saying that right, Ruhl. Uh, Constance Marola, Tracing Owls, and James L. Wilson. Thank you all for joining me, and uh, hope you like the content. And I'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.